Hello everybody, once again, this is Iron Petrie and welcome to Iron Petrie TV. I'm so glad that you chose to push play once again and join me on this journey that we've been on for the last uh, several weeks here where we've been talking about the subject of pride. Uh, I believe this is the fourth episode on this particular subject. and We've been just walking through the Word of God, dealing with the subject of pride and how God sees it, what its definition is, and how it plays out in our lives and what it does to our lives as it relates to God and to others. Uh, if there's one thing that we see from the Word of God is that God has a very strong stand against pride. And so because of that, we don't want pride in our lives because it will undermine every great and mighty thing that God wants to do for us. And ultimately, that's the reason why I'm doing uh, these particular episodes on this on my channel here is because I want you to be able to walk in the fullness of God. I want you to be able to see the great things of God. I want God to be able to be God in your life. And one of the things that hinders him from being able to show us his grace in a much greater measure is when we, his children, live or walk in pride. And so we're going to continue with this lesson uh, today. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically center up on one story in Scripture uh, to use as a foundation for this particular episode. And it's found, if you're following in your Bibles, in 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. And uh, for sake of time, <clears throat> because I do like to try to respect your time and not have these, these episodes too long, I'm going to give you some backstory about this that you can go back and read on your own. And then we're going to kind of jump into the middle of the, of the story and we're going to pick up reading in the text in the middle of the story and then we'll go on from there. But if there is something um, that shows us a, a real good snapshot of pride working in someone's life, it's this particular story. And uh, this story is about a gentleman named Naaman. Now, Naaman is the captain of the host for the king of Syria and he has leprosy. And this leprosy is really bad, and um, his skin is really bad. And this man is a man of, of uh, he's a man of rank. He's a man of note. He's a man of, of power. Um, he's also a man that's been quite successful because he, he is called in Scripture a mighty man of valor. And the king of Syria uh, held him in very, very high regard. And so dealing with Naaman, Naaman's not just some anybody. Naaman is a man that is, is very much well regarded in all of Syria, very well respected. So much so that uh, there's a, his wife has a mistress who happens to be from Israel, a servant. And this young girl is serving alongside Naaman's wife. And, uh, and evidently, according to scripture, she notices that Naaman has leprosy. And she lets um, Naaman's wife know that there is uh, a prophet in Israel or someone that can heal him of his leprosy. And she kind of mentions it and makes known about it. And so then the king of Syria, who respects Naaman so much, sends a letter to the king of Israel uh, to, to heal him of this leprosy. But of course, the king of Israel is like, I can't heal anybody. I'm not a god. I can't make anybody live or die. <laughs> and so he's thinking something else is wrong. But then the prophet Elisha, the prophet Elisha says, no, send Naaman to me so that he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. And so to make a long story short, Naaman then comes to Elisha the prophet. And when he comes to Elisha the prophet, uh, he has an encounter with him that we're going to pick up with um, in the process of this to see kind of where pride plays a role in this particular issue. Now, keep in mind Naaman's not just anybody. This is a man of rank. This is a man of, of power. This is a man of note. And we're going to pick up the story in uh, verse number 9 of chapter 5, 2 Kings 5 once again. It says, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a servant unto him, saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will come again to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry. <laughs> Naaman gets hot, right? He says, and went away and said, behold, I thought, listen to what Naaman says. I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. And then he goes on to say, are not Abana and Papar, these are rivers, rivers of Damascus better 
than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. So now this is Naaman. He's a leper. His skin is a mess. And he comes to Elisha the prophet. When he gets to Elisha the prophet, Elisha doesn't even come out to meet him. Now, once again, this is Naaman. This is captain of the host of the king of Syria. This man is no small, normal, average dude. And Naaman's bringing all of his horses. Oh, he's got his chariot. <laughs> he's got his servants with him. And they're all coming up to the door of Elisha's place uh, where Elisha lives. And Elisha won't even come out the house. Now, this is an affront to Naaman and his status, right? And so Naaman's pride is about to be confronted because Elisha then sends out his servant. Elisha's not going to come out the house. Elisha says, go out there and tell him to go dip in the uh, River Jordan and uh, his flesh will come again. <laughs> I mean, this is hilarious when you sit here and think about it because, because when you think of pride, one of the worst things that can happen to somebody who's full of pride is to be treated like they're nobody. One of the worst things that can happen to somebody who thinks they're someone of rank and they should be respected and they should be called by their titles and known by who they are and known for, for them to be told, hey, uh, and not only to be told face to face, but to be told secondhand. Elisha sends the servant to tell him, says, go wash in the pool, uh, go wash in the Jordan River and, and your flesh will come again. Do it seven times and, and you'll be healed. Naaman is not feeling it. He is not wanting to hear it. And not only does Naaman not want to hear it, he goes on to explain why. He says, I thought at least this man of God would come out, wave his hand over my leprous skin, call on the name of his God and would heal me that way. He said, and not only is he not doing that, then he tells me to go dip in the river Jordan. And then Naaman gives you his opinion about the river Jordan, because then he brings up these other rivers like Abana and Parpar. And he says, these rivers in Damascus, are they not better than the Jordan River? And you want me to go dip and wash in that? Or in other words, you, you not only disrespect me by not coming out of your house, you then tell me to go dip in some dirty river here in Israel. <laughs> so, so, he, so he is totally put off by this entire process that Elisha is, is on to get him healed. And so here we have Elisha's instruction, which undoubtedly being the prophet of God is coming from God, juxtaposed to Naaman's pride. Naaman's pride causes him to go away in rage. He's upset. He's mad. He can't stand it. I want to stop right here and I want to, I want to put a pause in the story and I want to ask you something. What if the miracle God has for you involves you doing something that is not consistent with the way you see yourself? What, what does David say in the Psalms? Selah. <laughs> I want you to pause and reflect on that. What happens in our lives when God's instruction is not consistent with our self-image. Because this is in essence the issue that Naaman is having. Naaman is saying, look, I'm captain of the host. I'm somebody of importance. You could have at least done me the common courtesy of coming out of your house and doing something great. Now, why does that appeal to Naaman? It appeals to Naaman because pride always wants to be treated on the level it believes it should be treated on. It, 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 it's as though it's not enough that Elisha is giving him the means to be healed. There is a way that it has to be given to him. You see, and that's pride gone to seed. When you can't even hear the instruction to have something in your life healed, if it goes against the way you see yourself. And so here is Naaman in pride. He's full of leprosy. But look at what Naaman's servant says to him. Gives us insight into this man's psyche. 
in, in uh, verse 13, it says, and his servant came near and spoke unto him and said, my father, look at, listen at this. If the prophet had asked you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much rather than when he says unto you, wash and be clean. He says to Naaman, sir, if the prophet had asked you for something that was compatible with your ego, you would have did it. If he had asked you to do something that was compatible with your pride, you would have had no problem. But he appeals to Naaman's ego and he disarms Naaman by saying, so what's the big deal about washing? Just go wash. Just go wash and be clean. And after appealing to Naaman, Naaman has enough sense to go and dip in the river Jordan seven times as Elisha's servant told him, or Elisha said through his servant to him. And to make the long story short, he's made whole. He's cleansed and his skin comes brand new. As a matter of fact, like a baby skin, like it had never, ever happened ever before. Like he had never had leprosy in his life. Here is the moral to the entire story. If Naaman keeps his pride, he keeps his leprosy. If Naaman keeps his pride, he keeps his leprosy. Here is Naaman coming face to face with the prophet of God, with the power and the anointing of God to make him clean. But the thing standing between him and his cleansing is his pride. And if he keeps that pride and he doesn't listen to his servant, he's going to go away as leprous as he came. You see, child of God, many times in our lives, <clears throat> God brings us face to face with his power to heal us, to deliver us, to prosper us, to put us over in life, to make us a success in life, to do us good, to bring our families together, to bring our ministries to a place of success, to bring our every endeavor. He, anytime it is, it is according to his will, God wants it to prosper. Now, now, when you say prosper now, these people have all kind of funny ideas about it. But God, God is for the prosperity of his servants. He says so in his scriptures, point blank. God wants you to prosper when you're doing things obedient to his will. He wants them to go well. But a lot of times these things don't go well because God will give us an instruction that goes against our ego. He will give us an instruction that is incompatible with the way we see ourselves. And when he gives us an instruction that's incompatible with the way we see ourselves, we are then tempted to do like Naaman. Now notice here, Naaman's got an entire way in his mind of how this healing is supposed to happen. That's the only reason he gets upset. He gets upset because he's thinking, you know, I'm Naaman. When I go down here, I've got all my horses, my, my servants, my chariot. I'm, 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 I'm rolling up on Elisha's place then Elisha is going to come out and there's going to be some grand thing happen because after all, you know, I'm Naaman. I'm, I'm the captain of the host of the king of, of Syria. This is who I am. And so he's got this thing all played out in his mind. And this is what pride does. Pride prescribes for God. Pride will prescribe for God how he ought to do things in your life. And a lot of times pride makes that prescription and this is what we call it, vision. <laughs> we call pride's prescription for how God ought to do certain things in our lives, our vision. It's our vision. We've got a vision of how God's going to do what God's going to do. And we've got this vision in our hearts and this vision in our heads and this vision in our minds as to what God's going to do, how he's going to do it. And we call it a vision, but really it is a machination. It's a creation of our own pride and our own ego. We want God to do something that is compatible with the way we see ourselves. And when God comes with a different instruction that requires humility, that requires me 
to now take a step down. What do we do with that? This is why so many lives and so much of the plan of God many times is thwarted in the life of many children of God. It's not that God doesn't love you. God loves you. He's on your side. He's always for you. There is never a waking moment of your life God is not for his children. Um, put that out of your mind. <laughs> he loves you indefinitely and eternally, right? And so one of the things, though, that stops him is because we don't like certain instructions he gives. We're like Naaman. We got our own vision. This is how it's going to happen. You're going to come out here. You're going to wave the hand over my body. You're going to do something real deep real spiritual, and then I'm going to be healed. You're definitely not going to have me show up after I drove all this way, came all this way, <laughs> and you're going to send your servant out to me to go dip in a muddy river. That ain't happening. But child of God, that's where his healing was. That's where the power was. That's where the anointing was to make him whole. That's where his date with a miracle was. And so much of the time, we're forfeiting our date with God's miracle-working power in our lives because we refuse the instructions that don't agree with our own ego. So, I say it again, if Naaman keeps his pride, he keeps his leprosy. If he keeps the pride, he keeps his leprosy. Now I want to show you one other, one other uh, particular story here, and it's in Acts chapter uh, number 10. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all the verses of Scripture, but I want to read the ones that are very pertinent and important. I want to give you a little backstory for this too, because this story is about a man named Cornelius. And Cornelius, in the book of Acts, chapter 10, is a devout man. He's praying, he's giving, and he's, he's interested in God. He's not born again, he's not a child of God, but he's interested and he wants to know God, and he's a Gentile. He's not a Jew. And he prays, and God gives him understanding and a revelation to send down uh, to Joppa because there's a man down there that can tell him words how he can be saved. In other words, it's, it's the Apostle Peter. And so he says, I've got somebody for you that will lead you in the way of salvation. And so Cornelius is obedient and he sends men to Joppa to go and find Peter. God even gives him the details, he gives him where to go, what house to go to, where it's located. God, God meets him at the point of his need because the man is hungry for God and God is going to send Peter to feed his hunger and to lead him to Jesus. And now Peter, meanwhile, is up on a housetop at this particular house and he's praying and he hadn't eaten yet. And Peter falls into a trance. And when Peter falls into a trance, he has this vision. And we're going to pick it up right here in this particular uh, story when it comes to this, this vision. Let's, let's look at verse 10 in Acts chapter 10. It says, And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And this is what Peter saw. He saw a heaven opened and a certain vessel descending up unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at four corners. And it let down to the earth. And inside of the sheet was all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time. And God said this, What I have cleansed, don't call uncommon. Then God goes on to lead Peter to get down off of the roof and to go with the men that Cornelius had sent to his house. To make a long story short, God gives Peter this vision about these unclean creatures that he thinks are unclean because God's about to send Peter to a Gentile. Now this is significant because the apostle Peter is a Jew. And he at this point does not know that the Gentiles have a part in salvation. So Peter has a religious and yes, a racial bias. Hear me now, hear me. And not only does he have a religious and racial bias, but it's really pride. 
And so God gives Peter this vision about eating these creatures that he considers to be unclean. And God says, don't call them unclean when I've cleansed them. And then he sends him to Cornelius's house. And to make a long story short, he gets to Cornelius' house. And I want to read you this verse of scripture because a lot of people, a lot of people misunderstand this. That when he gets to Cornelius' house and Peter opens his mouth in verse number 34, he says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now, people think when Peter got to Cornelius' house and said that he was saying that because he was just speaking by the Spirit of God. No. This was Peter having an epiphany. This was Peter having a revelation that evidently he had been wrong all this time. That his whole belief that this salvation was just for the Jews is wrong. This is Peter coming to the realization that God truly is of no respecter of persons. And Peter has gotten all out of his comfort zone. As a matter of fact, if we were to keep reading, you'll find that Peter actually is called to question by the Jews about this whole occurrence. Because he goes down here to preach to Cornelius' house. Cornelius' house gets born again. They get filled with the Holy Spirit. (laughs) And then Peter has to then explain himself to the Jews about how it happened. And Peter's like, look, all I know is God wants them to have everything we're having. Now look at this. What does this have to do with pride? I'll tell you exactly what it has to do with pride. Because if Peter keeps his religious and racial pride... He does not do the will of God and open the gospel to the Gentile world. Child of God, what if God's assignment, God's plan, God's will for your life is to go against your religious, racial pride? You see, you think you see, I know what you thought. You thought in the scripture that back in the day, these people didn't deal with the same stuff we're dealing with today. Uh Uh-uh. That's why the Bible is so truthful. That's why the Bible is so relevant. That's why the Bible is so needed because they're dealing with the same issues that people deal with today. And here is Peter, God breaking Peter out of his religious and racial comfort zone, bias and prejudice and pride into his ministry to the Gentile world. And the rest, as they say, is history. My question to you, whether you're Peter, whether you're Naaman, If you keep your pride, you miss the will of God. If we don't learn how to submit ourselves to God's will over our pride, the body of Christ is going to find itself missing God. And we're and heretofore, and I don't mean this to be condescending. I don't mean this to be rude. But in many areas, the church is missing God today because we are hidden behind a wall of religious prejudice and pride, racial prejudice and pride, personal prejudice and pride. And we're missing God's best for the body of Christ. We're missing God's best for our own individual lives. What if God's will is going to take you beyond your prejudices? Can you swallow your pride and do it? Huh? What if God's will is to take you beyond all of the particular, uh, you know, hangups we have about this, that or the other. And we keep these things because of our own personal pride. You've seen two instances right here in scripture. One Old Testament, one New Testament of two people being brought face to face with God's will juxtaposed to their preconceptions and their pride. Fortunately for us, both of these men were willing to discard their pride for the will of God. My question for us is, is that what we're going to do? Right now in your life, you may be faced with something that you're dealing with or you're going through. I challenge you, ask yourself, is pride the reason why I'm in this? Is is pride the reason why I'm here? Is pride the reason why this church isn't growing? Because I'm telling you, if it's pride, the only way to solve it is humility. Is pride the reason why my finances are where they are? Is pride the reason why my marriage is where it is? Is pride the reason why my body and my health is where it is? Because if it is, I'm going to echo to you the statement I just made earlier. If you keep your pride, Just like Naaman would have kept his leprosy, you'll keep your problem. 
If you keep your pride, you'll keep your problem. I encourage you. I implore you. As a matter of fact, I plead with you today. Discard the pride and receive the grace of God that is sufficient to meet every one of your needs. And if you happen to find yourself in the place where you're like the Apostle Peter, and God's calling you to do something, giving you instructions to do something that goes against your pride or your preconceptions or even your prejudice or even your comfort zone, come out of that comfort zone. Come out from behind those prejudices. Come out from behind that wall and do the will of God. God bless you, man. I'm out of time for another episode. Man, I'm so excited teaching this. I cannot wait till the next episode because we're going to jump into a story that everybody knows. It's a story about the prodigal son, or is it? (laughs) But we're, we're going to jump into that and we're going to show you pride's work in the story of the man and his two sons and how it relates to us in the body of Christ today. And I'm telling you, it promises to be powerful and I can't wait to see you then. But until next time, God bless you. I love you and we'll see you next time. Hello, everybody. I just wanted to take the time to come on here and to ask you and invite you to subscribe to this channel, as well as to connect with me on all of my social media platforms. Look, this channel, as well as my social media platforms, exist to spread the word of God to you. So if you would do me the favor in helping me spread the word of God, I would like for you to subscribe to this channel, as well as share the link to these episodes with people you believe could really benefit from hearing the word of God. God bless you. Until next time, I'll See ya.